Guys, yeah, so today I'm going to be taking a look at how you can use AI in the browser. So this is more of a general introduction to this topic, and I'm going to be looking at how you can use the specific applications of AI around things like video processing or image processing or natural language processing in uh, separate videos where I'm going to be looking at specific demos and also some of the source code that you can use to support these applications. But this is going to be a general overview of this topic. And I'm going to be talking through what is the kind of the history of AI in the browser and I'm going to look at some of the frameworks you can use and then how this might be applied in different contexts, not only in the web, but also in things like mobile and desktop development as well. So to differentiate what I'm talking about when I say AI in the browser, I'm not talking about a web app in the sense that I'm going to be running a web app that calls a server. In this case, I typically will have a web app running in a client of some kind, a laptop, maybe a phone or something. And it then calls out to some kind of backend server. And in many use cases, that might process AI type workloads on those servers. And this is certainly a valid way of doing AI, especially for large applications that need access to large language models that might not be conducive for a client application. However, what I'm going to be covering here is more kind of the inverse of this, where in this case, I have a, a laptop, a client of some kind, it could be a desktop or a phone. And in this case, the server is going to deliver to that client a model and the model is actually going to run on the client. Now that delivery of that model could be done in a number of different ways. It might be installed with the application, which is one way that we're going to talk about in a minute, or it might be downloaded whenever the application loads. And there's certainly uh, trade-offs for doing it this way, but it also brings things a little bit closer to the edge. And that's one of the main use cases for running AI in a browser context. So let's look at some of the ways that this might manifest itself through browser technology. So the most obvious use case for this kind of technology is the web. And in this case, we're going to be talking about using a URL to access a web page that's going to download content typically from a CDN or some kind of online code repository like a web server. And the real advantage of this is you get the AI model close to the user and it's delivered in the way that a web page would typically be delivered. And so it's ubiquitous across pretty much everything that has a screen on it that has somewhat of a powerful user experience. So this would be mobile and desktop. And it's delivered through a browser that's already installed on the device. So you have access to things like Windows, Chrome OS, Mac OS, iOS, Android, and so on. So this gives you the ability to pretty much target everything that's already out there. The caveat of doing a web uh, experience is that you will have to deliver models across the same kind of delivery mechanism. And so it typically will require a fast and reliable internet connection for the models to uh, be delivered in a timely manner. Some of these models can be dozens of megabytes in size. Some of them can even be hundreds of megabytes in size. So this is really pushing kind of the upper limits of what you would typically deliver in a web application, which are typically going to be uh, maybe no more than a dozen megabytes, maybe uh, two dozen megabytes in size if you're dealing with a large uh, web application. But if you're going to be delivering a model, it's going to kind of push that out to the upper limits of what you typically think of a web application uh, as using. So if a network constraint is going to be a problem, then maybe you should consider mobile or desktop, but it might not be a problem if you're going to be delivering applications through a web browser to clients that you know will have a reliable internet connection, like a corporate intranet, or maybe it's a field office that you know might have a fiber connection or a reliable uh, cable or, or DSL connection, and you can trust that that will be available to the end user and therefore deliver that application to that end user using the web model. However, if that's not a possibility, you're going to be targeting clients that might have network constraints or might be in an offline capacity, then using a mobile or web application might be a good way to deliver browser technology, including AI models, through uh, more traditional channels like mobile applications or desktop applications. Well, in this case, with a mobile application, you're basically uh, using some kind of native application that bootstraps some kind of web view. And then that web view will then uh, load up some kind of content that's installed right alongside that application. And some examples of this would be like Ionic or Cordova or Framework 7. Now, in this case, models are, are and the supporting code are installed right alongside of the application and they're delivered through 
an, an app store, or maybe it's an internal app store as a, a corporate application, but it might be on the Google Play, or it might be the Apple App Store on that platform. So this one basically just installs it. it it's on the device already, and so you can use it uh, just like you would any other kind of application and if you're disconnected you can still use the ai model if you're connected you can use the ai model it doesn't really change that and so this allows you to take the model into areas that might have network constraints where you might not otherwise be able to use something like a web page so it's certainly a possibility you install the application then you go into those environments that are a little bit more challenging so this would obviously be for android and ios being that those are the two major mobile operating systems. Now, a desktop experience is similar to this, but it just doesn't have the, it does not as mobile, but you have typically at your fingertips a little bit more power than what you would get with a mobile experience like on a phone. And so this is going to leverage uh, the kinds of frameworks that uh, build browser-based technology applications for the desktop experience. And a couple of examples of this would be like Electron or NWJS. Uh, which basically install some version of a browser, typically based on WebKit, which is the basics for browsers like Safari and Chrome OS. And it will install that right alongside your code, and then it will load that uh, browser, and then it will then load your code in that browser off the local file system, and then treat it more like a desktop application in that case. Towery is a little bit different in that it just uses the native uh, browser experience on whatever platform you're using. So in the case of uh, Windows, it's going to use a web view that's uh, basically based on the Edge platform, but it's going to load the web view into uh, memory, which is typically already installed on a Windows device. And then it's going to bootstrap that particular web view and then load your content uh, alongside of it. So Towery apps tend to be a little bit smaller than Electron or NWJS, but it relies on the underlying operating system already having those web components installed. In either case, you end up with a desktop application with your code and then also your models installed on that local device. And so you can take that offline and you have supporting code and you have your models. You can take that offline and you can use it in much the same way you can use a mobile application. But of course, with the limitations of what a laptop or a desktop will have with them but it enables you to have cross-platform offline applications for uh, operating systems like Chrome OS, uh, Windows, and Mac OS for that matter. So in summary, this is more for uh, web pages and this is more for uh, the more mobile experience or the desktop experiences where you wanna pre-install the, the code and then use the applications like they're desktop or applications that are mobile. In any case though, the underlying technology for this is pretty much the same. It's a browser uh, based technology. So it's gonna be used leveraging things like uh, WebGL, WebGPU, uh, different kinds of UI elements like HTML, CSS, and it's going to be using code like JavaScript to kind of take all of that and, and bring it together uh, to create an entire application for whatever it is that you might be targeting. So the two frameworks that I'm gonna be using in my demos are tensorflow.js and transformers.js. Now there are certainly other ways to do AI in the browser, but these two frameworks offer abstractions that make using models in the browser uh, much simpler and much easier to do. So tensorflow.js, as the name implies, is just an adaptation in JavaScript of TensorFlow. TensorFlow came out of the, the, the Google camp several years ago and was widely popular and still is, but other frameworks have kind of challenged it recently. But it enables you to do all kinds of different things with machine learning. And so you can define, train, and run machine learning models uh, in the context of JavaScript. So there's no external dependencies for tensorflow.js to run. It's completely running in the context of JavaScript. So that means you can run it purely with Node or you can run it purely in a web browser. And so it adapted TensorFlow and this allows you to use JavaScript and web technologies like Wasm to either run it on a CPU if you don't have a GPU available or use a GPU by way of WebGL. And WebGL is a, an older standard, but it leverages a device's GPU to do many common things that would be GPU accelerated like shader calculations and so on, which are very similar to the kinds of things that you do inside of AI models. And so 
TensorFlow.js will try to leverage WebGL on the GPU to get you hardware acceleration within the context of a browser. And so that works for a mobile GPU or a desktop GPU, depending on which one is available. And pretty much every device has a GPU uh, at this point. Even if it's a modest GPU, it still has one that can run WebGL. Another framework that has more recently emerged is Transformers.js. And it is from Hugging Face, and Hugging Face is a large repository for all things AI. So it has models and it has frameworks and so on. And this particular one is based on the Onyx framework from Microsoft. And Onyx is a, a format for models, and these models can then be delivered uh, through the Onyx format. And these will also run on top of a CPU or a GPU. And this one is uh, trying to leverage WebGL or in some cases WebGPU if it's available. And WebGPU is an emerging standard intended to replace WebGL. Uh, it's much newer, to, so it's taking advantage of some of the newer features available on, G, uh, on GPUs that WebGL doesn't have. And so it acts as more of an accelerator than what you would otherwise get with WebGL. But still, regardless, uh, it will give you hardware acceleration in the same way that WebGL will for the kinds of applications that Transformers.js will support. Both of these will have a lot of different models that they can run. So there's a lot of overlap in what they are capable of doing. And so it's not that one of these is better than the other. It's basically trying to get down into the weeds about what kind of application you're trying to build and which one of these is going to do that particular application best. And I, and in my experience, sometimes it's TensorFlow.js, sometimes it's Transformers.js, depending on what I'm trying to do. So here's a list of all the demos I want to do kind of over a series of videos. So look at the playlist to see which one of these are going to be covering each one of these if you're interested in these. But uh, categories are going to be image processing, video processing, audio processing, and natural language processing. Now, image processing is doing things like image classification, where you're basically taking an image and describing the object that is the subject of that image. Another one might be object detection, which is looking for multiple objects embedded in an image rather than trying to do the entire image. And then, of course, image captioning is where you generate a description of the image, of maybe describing what the subject is doing in that context. Another thing you can do with video processing is similar to image processing is do object detection, but do it in real time. So taking a video feed and then taking frames from that video feed and do object detection against those frames so that you can see what's going on. And this is useful for applications like security or other kinds of similar things like that, where you might be wanting to look at when something moves into a frame, moves out of a frame and trying to identify what that might be. Another cool thing you can do with video processing is face, mark land, uh, face landmark detection, which is where you can create a three-dimensional model of a face from a two-dimensional image. And there are models for that like wrapped up in MediaPipe face mesh, which is a really cool library for doing that. And for natural language processing, you have several different things that you can do with just an LLM, but these are specific models designed for specific kinds of tasks, such as sentiment analysis, and there's two examples of that. And then there's question answering, which is basically where you have a corpus of text and you ask a question and it's able to produce an answer. And then summarization, which is able, which is taking a large corpus of text and reducing it down to a few sentences that capture the essence of what that is trying to get at. All of these are different natural language processing tasks, and there's certainly other ones that you could do, but these are just some examples I'm going to be using. And then, of course, audio processing. I'm going to look at how you can do speech to text, which is a, a fairly common mode of input for applications nowadays, especially in the mobile space. And we're going to be using uh, JavaScript to do that with. Now, there's an API you can do that naturally in the browser with, but it requires an internet connection. So we're going to show you how you can do it offline using the Whisper model and using uh, Transformers.js with Whisper to get you a transcription based on that model. So all of these are, are the upcoming demos. So like I said, check out the video description below and also the playlist associated with this so that you can get all of these and more associated with how to do AI in a browser. If you like this content, please consider subscribing to the channel by clicking on the subscribe button. You can also like this content by clicking on the thumbs up or share this content with your friends and also comment in the comment section down below. You can also find me online at www.blaze.net or on Twitter at The One Mule. And as always, thanks for watching.